Okay. It's nice to be here. Thank you. Uh, we'll start actually immediately with a clip from a video. Could we just have the, the front lights down if possible? That would be great. Okay, Glass, record a video. This is it. We're on in two minutes. Okay, Glass, hang out with the Flying Club. Google photos of tiger heads. Hmm. You ready? You ready? Right there. Okay, Glass, take a picture. <laughs> So beginning the, really is the title, and if, if you know both sides of the title, then two marks to you. If you know the first part, which is the Google Glass part, it was that aspect there. There we go. That's the Google Glass. It looks like a, some glasses on the beautiful girl there. Um, in effect, there's, not, there's no glasses, but it's a small little computer that attaches around your head like glasses. And the technology is all within it to be able to uh, link you up to the world and the computer and the internet. So Google Glass, and this is one particular version of this type of technology, is an attempt to try to interact with the world even more closely than it would be with a mobile phone. That's the thing itself. That's the first part of it, through the Google Glass darkly. Those of you, though, that will recognize that there's a second part to this, and that's uh, the King James translation <laughs> of the, the Bible, and then that reference there in the first letter of Corinthians, for now we see through a glass darkly. It has um, different translations there. It comes from chapter 13 uh, of that first letter of the Corinthians. And Paul is talking about um, how, as human beings in this world, we are not seeing too clearly at the moment. So let me just read you a little bit from that. For we know only imperfectly, and we prophesy imperfectly. But only perfection comes, only when perfection comes, all imperfect things will be done away with. When I was a child, I used to talk like a child, and see things like a child does, and think like a child. But now I have become an adult. I have finished with all childish ways. And then the phrase itself, now we see only reflections in a mirror, mere riddles, but then we shall be seeing face to face. We live in a world which is pounding us with huge amounts of information, um, more than any other period in human history before. The amount of information that we can access uh, throws up large amounts of Sen sensory stimulation, really, the little 
a little child here in some ways, a sight of wonder, just a few of the things that you'll be able to pick up. In some ways, we probably don't know how rich we have been and enriched we have been with the experiences that have been given us. <coughs> a couple of things th thrown in here. Uh, these are a few things from National Geographic. Um, this is a kind of a, a, a coral. It's called a honeycomb coral. You find it around Indonesia. It glows all of its own. Strange picture. It's, a, it's actually a wonderful little picture from uh, Madagascar. The limestone has been worn away over a thousand, probably millions of years. And those, those men in white are actually lemurs. They live on the top of it. They bounce around on the top. The technology and the information, though, takes us to other parts of the world. And we can see the great glories of human technology as well, um, such as uh, this in, in Dubai, caught in a Gulf storm. Beautiful photograph. But also, the internet and the technology takes us into other things as well. Parts of the world where we can glimpse that perhaps all is not well. This is a, a junkyard in Canada, illustrating again the use of the materials, how they just get crushed. You know, what's happening to our world? The internet, in many ways, has get, as well as giving us experience and stimulation, it also shows us uh, some of the other sides of our world. But what the internet and technology and education has done, and through especially electrically, we can contact across the world with all sorts of different things through human experience and through human history. World events. Where were you then? Also, the internet, though, connects us with other things. Darker experiences, if you've been following the newspaper in the last few days. Uh, this little girl is not real. She's actually a computer-generated, you know, called Sweetie. Um, but what the Dutch group have been doing is they've been targeting people uh, as pedophiles coming to, onto the internet searching for young girls. She's advertised as a 10-year-old Filipino. So the internet and the technology in which we're engaged with in our modern world, as well as showing us the beauties of the lemurs of Madagascar, also takes us into this area as well. As human beings, this is the area in which we are swimming, the world in which we are. Um, as we don't have any Heidegger or any um, Kierkegaard, I thought I'd give you a little bit of sensory overload today. Let me just see if I can get this right. My name is Sergeant Frank Drebin, Detective Lieutenant Police Squad, a special detail of the police department. There had been a recent wave of gorgeous fashion models found naked and unconscious in laundromats on the west side. Unfortunately, I was assigned to investigate holdups of neighborhood credit unions. I was across town doing my laundry when I heard the call on the double killing. It took me 20 minutes to get there. My boss was already on the scene. Attempted hold up, Frank. Cashier's the only witness. According to her, the gunman shot the teller. She grabbed the gun and shot the hold up man. It's the same MO as the others. It could be, but this one has an interesting wrinkle. The gunman twice is a good family man with no prior record. Can I talk to her? Sure. Sally Decker, Frank. Hello, Miss Decker. Hello. I'm Captain Frank Drebin. I understand you had a pretty rough time. Yeah, it was pretty bad. Cigarette? Yes, I know. Well, do you feel up to any questions? I'll try. Where were you when all this happened? I was right here at my desk working. And when was the first time you noticed something was wrong? Well, when I first heard the shot, and as I turned, Jim fell. Uh, he's a teller, Frank. But Jim Fell's a teller? No, Jim Johnson. Who's Jim Fell? Well, he's the auditor, Frank. He had the flu, so Jim filled in. Phil who? Uh, Phil did. He's the night watchman, Frank. <laughs> the bully Phil had been here. Right, now, wait a minute. Let me get this straight. 
Twice came in and shot the teller and Jim fell. No, he only shot the teller. Jim Johnson fell as ill. Okay, then after he shot the teller, you shot twice. No, I only shot once. Uh, twice is the hold-up man. Then I guess I did shoot twice. Well, so now you're changing your story. No, I shot twice after Jim fell. You shot twice and Jim fell? No, Jim fell first and then I shot twice once. Well, who fired twice? Once. Now, he's the owner of the tire company, Frank. Okay. Uh, once is the owner of the tire company and he fired twice. Then twice shot the teller once. Twice. And Jim fell and then you fired twice. Once. Okay. All right, that'll be all for now, Miss Decker. Now, we'll need you to make a formal statement down at the station. Oh, of course. You've been very helpful. We think we know how he did it. Oh, how he couldn't have done it. He hasn't been in for weeks. Well, thank you again, Mr. <laughs> weeks. Saul Weeks. He's the controller, Frank. <laughs> now, you may have thought you knew what that was. Actually, it was uh, not from a film called Naked Gun, which you may have thought it was from, um, but actually it was... Um, It was from a thing called Police Squad. And the, the interesting thing about Police Squad is it ran for only six episodes, six half-hour episodes. Um, and then they stopped it because the American public didn't like it. Why they didn't like it? Because they couldn't understand it and it was too intelligent, it was said to be. <laughs> and what they realized was that they were running it for the first... They thought it was really good, very important. But they realized that people were watching television wrongly. They were watching television and they were boiling kettles and they were cooking things. And so when they actually had to sit down and watch something, they didn't understand that because they were always looking away. Other things were kind of coming in onto their lives. So they just cancelled it after the first series. But as you could see going through it, the texture of all of the sight gags, the non sequiturs, all of those things weaving together. There's a question to, to do with overload and how much information we can take, how much information that we can absorb within us and would we like. There's a film that was done by David Cronenberg, a Canadian director a number of years ago, Existence, and it tells the story about gaming and it's gaming but you're plugging into the human being. There's actually you create a portal in your spine and you play games and the film is, is, a, is, a, is a fascinating thriller because you're never quite sure when is the game and when is real life. And so people can kind of plug into what thinks to be a great game to begin with, but then suddenly you're in different levels of existence. The question that comes from Google and Google Glass and the, some, some things like that is how much would we interact to get the sensory stimulation? So, for example, Google Glass takes the, the technology and keeps it with you almost during all of your working hours as you're wearing the glasses. And that's becoming a big issue, could become a big legal issue, a big ethical issue. How much of your daily life do you carry around with you? How much do you record? How much do you have a control over that? So, what we're dealing with again is information, vast amounts of information. The world in which we are living as well is shaped by that. I don't know if you recognize any of those people. It's the team from Match of the Day. I was having a discussion with one of my Jesuit colleagues a few days ago. And he was talking about just this issue. I had the game of football, he was a Tottenham supporter of all people. <laughs> but how the game of football is now shaped and changed by our perception through the television. So there was the time you just go to a match and you see the whole panorama in front of you. It's all there. You're watching it and that. But then you see it on the smaller screen and something like Match of the Day or any of the others or Sky Sports or whatever that would be. And you're watching it in quite a different way. You're watching it far more close up. You're seeing the repeats. You're seeing all the various different things. And what it tends to do is it changes our perception of the game. So, for example, the rules of the game are far more tightly drawn now. 
all of the things, whether it's football or whether it's cricket or tennis, all of the technology is onto the rules and the rule and all of the number of referees now that have taken. Whereas in the past, the game was just done and there was a blurred element to all of that. But now, even the games are only perceived because of the way that we can gather the information. We can gather the technology. That's the world in which we are living. Let me talk a little bit now on our spiritual dimension within that. St. Ignatius of Loyola was the founder of the Jesuits, and he wrote a little book. It's been functioning quite well at the moment. It's been kind of blocking up the viewer. Uh, it's this, St. Ignatius's, these are writings, but the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. The second paragraph of that um, is quite enlightening. Let me read it. You can read it there yourselves. For it is not so much knowledge that fills and satisfies the soul, but rather the intimate feeling and relishing of things. Ignatius in the exercises is talking to the director of a retreat, and he's giving that person instructions of what to do, how to handle this. One of the things in, the, in this particular annotation here He's, in, he's making sure that the director does not give too much information to the person doing the retreat. So the director should not be giving him all sorts of different books and theology texts and scripture analysis and all of those things. All of those things, as Ignatius would say, it's not knowledge that opens the human heart. Knowledge is the thing that's pounding us. But Ignatius would say, and in looking at a critique of our own world, he would say that the problem is, is we have huge amounts of information. One statistic would say that 95% of the books in the world will never be looked at again. They're all in libraries, they're all on shelves. All of that information is there. We're overloaded with it. And with all of the, the technology and the computer, the, tele the telephones, the television stations, and all of the various things that are there, it's all coming into us. But Ignatius would say, if he was giving us some items for guidance, the first thing he would say is that knowledge is not the important thing. All of that information that's coming in, take care. Let me give you a, a very quick rundown on the life of Ignatius, because I want to focus in on one aspect of his life. Probably know he was a, a Spaniard, a Basque actually from the north parts of, of Spain, and for the first 30 years of his life, he didn't get much of an education, except in swordsmanship, soldiery. He was a very good calligrapher as well, but he didn't have an education to actually write things about it. But he ended up in a place called Pamplona, a wonderful citadel city in the north of Spain. And the picture here indicates one of those aspects of his life that really changed his direction. At 30 years old, he was hit by a cannonball. Actually, he was hit twice. The cannonball hit a, hit a wall, and the wall dropped on his ugly leg, so it wasn't kind of, he was in pretty bad shape. He was carried back to Loyola, also in the Basque country, further up into the, the Basque country, to the, to the place where he came from. Now, there, after all sorts of different things that happened to him, he had to stay on his bed for about nine months. Um, he broke the, the leg very badly. The French who tried to repair it didn't repair it terribly well. He was sitting on the bed, he was in terrible pain, but even more so, his spirit was pained because he was feeling he will never get back to the court. He will never get all of his long leather boots on because there's a bit of bone sticking out. And so his vanity was taking over. And in fact, he actually tried to get beyond that. He got the doctors to saw off the little bit of bone uh, without an anesthetic, as he says in his autobiography. Um, but this then led to him being on that bed. And on the bed, you have Ignatius the soldier getting very annoyed, and he's looking for information. And he's looking for books, and the books he's looking for are a thing called Amadis the Gaul. It was a series of books of Spanish conquistadors, a bit like James Bond books. They kind of, they go on for a whole series of things. And he'd read them, and he, this was one of the few things he'd ever read. And so he thought, rather than being so bored out of his skull, he'd like some books to read. So he asked for Amadis. But his sister-in-law, Magdalena, was a very holy lady, and in the big castle of Loyola, there were only two books. Mm -hmm. 
One was the life of the saints and one was the life of Jesus Christ. And he got so bored, he asked to read those. So they're propped up in front of him and he's reading. And he starts to read and actually, he, despite what he was thinking, he got engrossed in what was going on. So eventually Magdalena managed to get him some of the Amadis books. So he had these two books, these two sets of books, by the side of his bed. And so he's reading. Now he's getting entranced by the lives of the saints because he comes across people like St. Francis and St. Dominic. And he says, I could do what Francis can do. I can do what Dominic can do. Francis, he walked on herbs and got to Jerusalem. I can do that. He started then reading the Amadis books and seeing all of these guys, the daring do and the sort of rescuing of maidens and the sort of slaying of dragons and all of that type of thing. <coughs> I can do that. No problem. I can do that. And then you get to the point which is probably the greatest point for Ignatius' spiritual journey. He's lying on the bed and he sees both of these things. He sees that his heart is raised when he reads about the lives of the saints. He finds his heart raised when he reads around about Amadis and all of the, the conquistadors. He sees them ex heart responding exactly the same way. However, when he puts the Amadis books down and he gets on with other things, he finds his heart kind of drops and he's very dissatisfied. When he read the lives of the saints, and he puts them down, and he's still jizzed up. He continues to be jizzed up. He doesn't disappear. And at 30 years old, this is like a lightning flash in Ignatius' life. Because for the first time, he notices he's got a heart. Before then, he's been responding to the experiences. He'll fight when he needs to fight. He'll, fight, he'll become a lover when he wants to become a lover. All of those different things. He works on the experiential all the way through. And he goes through quite happily doing that. And at 30 years old, this changes. Because suddenly, he sees something different within himself. <coughs> the Jesuits tend to call it discernment of spirits. The recognition that in the human heart, the human heart is constantly um, moving. There are things inside the heart that are moving 24 hours a day. All sorts of different things. And Ignatius now starts on a pilgrimage which is an inner pilgrimage. He gets entranced with what's going on in his heart. And he sees these various movements, things he hadn't seen before, things huge in emotions that are there, very passionate, angry, sad, ecstatic, all sorts of different things. And now he starts to look back and into them. And he sees, and he starts to categorize them, as he can start to categorize the lives of the saints and the Amadis, the way that they've affected him. And he starts now to systematize them and start to see where, where is God. And this is the thing. He starts to notice that the presence of God is to be found by following these spirits that are within. It's the spiritual life that he starts now. But he's being bombarded by all of these things internally now and externally. And he's very confused and he wants to find what to do. And so he starts on a physical pilgrimage. He moves away from Loyola. He eventually treks his way across northern Spain, gets down to a place called Manresa, which is north of Barcelona, and he ends up in a cave there for another nine months. But this time, he's kind of trying to pray and he's getting some guidance from the, the monks in the Benedictine monastery in, in, in Manresa. And he's trying just to try and put it together. And it's at that time he starts to make notes now of his, the wisdom that he's gaining. P things that people say to him, things that he recognizes in himself. And it's those insights that become the core of the spiritual exercises. starts the search for God. Maybe let's just look a little bit and see what's the, the God that Ignatius starts to find. 
And maybe we'll just kind of pause for a moment, because what I'd like to do is just go back into our Christian heritage and talk a little about that God that Ignatius is following. In the Old Testament, there's... If you look and you try to piece together a photo fit of the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, we get a picture which sometimes it's difficult to see just by reading the individual books. And within the Old Testament, there is one huge contradiction. And that's the one I'd like to talk a little bit about, because in some ways, hopefully, you may find it helpful for your prayer, because it takes us also into the heart of what Ignatius would see as our prayer. <coughs> that's the, what is known as the tetragram. Um, one way of, that you think it is to be pronounced is Yahweh. The four... The four letters, this, 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 and this. And so they think that the pronunciation was Yahweh because of the, it doesn't give you the vowels, these are just the consonants. But this is the holy word that you find that is given to Moses at the burning bush. Some translations used to put, call it Jehovah. But that was actually a wrong translation. But what they were doing was they were taking the tetragram, those four letters, and putting different vowel sounds into it. But anyway, it takes it down and through. Now, one of the things is interesting in... This is the first part of the contradiction within the Old Testament and our Christian heritage. Is that the Jews, unlike any other people around them, did not make pictures of God. You do not find any images of God that are there. You don't find any images that is not described like the, um, like the Egyptians would, would have a God as a cat or as the sun. Others would have it as trees and that type of thing. Nothing in the created universe is taken and used as a representative for God. The only thing that you will find is the tetragram and it's just used in the Hebrew writing. God is holy. And even to the point that that becomes a word that you should not pronounce. So the word Yahweh that I was pronouncing there would be anathema to the Jew. You should not say that. They would always translate it and use the different word, the Lord. So this is one of the things that you find. The Jewish people, in trying to put together unconsciously, and you, see, you can take it from the, the books as it's going through, as the Old Testament books start to perceive who is God, as God reveals himself to the people, Bit by bit, they learn about this God. Abraham knows a little bit about God. Moses knows more. David knows even more. And then you get through to the prophets. They start building on each other. This is where the contradiction comes in, though. There's no way that you can paint a picture of God. There's no Jewish art like that. Yet, verbally, if you look at the Old Testament and you see what is the character of God, you get a huge amount of things. Piecing these together, so God has, in the way that they describe God, God has a face, he's got eyes, he's got ears, he's got a mouth, got nostrils, hands and feet. They never paint a picture, but they paint pictures in words. God acts. How does God act? He speaks. These are all in the old, you can find them all in the Old Testament. He speaks. He can hear, he smells, he can laugh, he hisses, he whistles, he strikes, he writes, and he walks. Emotionally, God is delighted. He shows joy, anger, hatred, love, disgust, regret, compassion. And what we have is, and again, this is where the scripture scholars are trying to say, on one hand, you have the tetragram, which cannot even be pronounced, you cannot tell. On the other hand, you have this hugely personal God. Unconsciously, the Jews are piecing together a picture of God, and they're holding these two things in tension. God is utterly other, but God has a personality. And that's the key to Christian prayer as well. In the New Testament, taking this even further, the person of Christ. God becomes incarnate. 
And so this is one of those things which is important for us to know about our Chris Christian heritage in terms of how we relate to God, because that affects our prayer. <coughs> so prayer, and prayer for Ignatius of Loyola very strongly, prayer is a relationship. It's a relationship. So prayer is not, again, like other prayers that they would have found in other... So if you go to the Greek gods, they have, they have personalities. They sit on the top of Olympus. But what they have is they're very strange personalities. And the best thing that human beings find is you just keep the gods happy and keep away from them. That's not the God of the Jews, not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is not the God of the Christians either. And sometimes it's, it's far easier to actually move away from this type of image of God as having personality. It's far easier to avoid that. But that takes us right into the solid heart of the mystery. And this, in some ways, it goes right to the heart of Ignatian prayer. It's, it's mainstream Christianity. Our prayer is a personal relationship with God. And this is the thing that Ignatius found when he was on his bed of pain because he recognized that the Spirit of God was ebbing and flowing through his life in his heart. And not just that, the Spirit of God was outside in the world as well, in God's creation. And suddenly, you get this phrase that's sometimes attached to Ignatian spirituality, finding God in all things. So prayer is very important for Ignatius of Loyola. And in some ways, if he was here today, he would say to us, right, that's the key to prayer throughout all generations. It's a personal relationship with God. It's not just a reading of a prayer. It's not just a reciting of a prayer. And sometimes we can get into that. I'll say this prayer, I'll say that prayer, and I've done my prayers. Okay. Ignatius says, no, 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 no. Let me just say three prerequisites, maybe. Prayer is a relationship, and developing that relationship, three Ignatian, for want of a better word, three Ignatian attitudes. First one, pick up the picture from before, wonder. Ignatius would love that picture. <coughs> to his later days, when he died in his mid-sixties, every night he would go and sit on the roof of the Jesuit house in Rome, and he would just look at the stars. That was his entertainment. He just looked at the stars. If he wanted to relax, looked at Ignatius, looked at the creation around him. Ignatian prayer as well, despite sometimes you may come across the spiritual exercise. My advice is if you come across the spiritual exercise, don't try and read it. It's actually like a car manual. It, it's not terribly, it's, it's actually written for the director. And for the director, like a car manual, is wonderful for an engineer. It's very, very helpful, the spiritual exercise. But it's not a very good read. Ignatius would say himself, he is not a great stylist. Uh, among all the great kind of spiritual writers, Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross, have him kind of beaten hands down. Uh, poor Ignatius, he kind of, he's got straightforward vocabulary and he uses it. But if you read the book, you'll think, gosh, this is strange. It's very regimented. Very regimented. Point A, point B. Pray about this. Do this. Repeat that. Say now, Father. But that's not Ignatian prayer. That's the Khan manual. So, second prerequisite, wonder would be one of them. You've got to have that wonder of the world. Hearts on fire. Passion. Ignatian spirituality is passionate. Ignatius would say, it's the passionate heart that seeks God. A tepid heart won't do it. You've got to be passionate, hot or cold. You've got to be passionate. It's that, because the heart seeks God. That inner journey is within the heart, the crucible of the heart. It's all to do with love. And Ignatius would see that. The heart loves, and it seeks God, and it's seeking the ultimate lover. And it finds all aspects of love in the world, and it's passionate about it. Prayer should be passionate. The search for God, passionate. The third prerequisite is the worldview. Ignatius is not afraid. He sees the world and it's God's creation. 
This goes quite against some spiritualities that say that, even some Christian spiritualities, which say, oh no, you've got to keep protected, keep away. The world is evil place. The world is a nasty place. It will contaminate me. And therefore, kind of you kind of put you enclose the wagons against the Indians. No, that's not the Ignatian. The Ignatian worldview is open. And the other thing is it's trusting. Ignatius, in one of the other parts of the annotations, says to the director, when the director's talking to the retreatant, if you don't understand what the retreatant says, ask them about it. And it's part of the Ignatian tradition. You do you you don't make a bad construction about something. You make good constructions. If somebody says something to you, you basically trust what they're saying. So you're going out into the world and you're trusting the world. You're trusting people. You're not trusting them, not looking at people and saying, oh gosh, not you, not you. No, you go in and you're, you're basically respecting the spirit of God that is out there, out there in the world around us, out there in the human beings that we meet, because that spark of God is there. And until you learn otherwise, because of particular things, you must trust the world. Keep the, w the vision wide. Ignatius was never one against doubting science. One of the Jesuit traditions is constantly looking at all sorts of strange disciplines, which are not necessarily religious. So there are people doing theology, there are people doing philosophy, and there are people like that. But we've got people doing astronomy and genetics and all sorts of different things, because they're looking at the world, and the world is a trustworthy place, a place to be explored. Ignatius is a magpie. Some people say it's Ignatian prayer, and they'll pick up a particular thing and say, oh, that's Ignatian prayer, isn't it? Well, actually, no. Ignatius has normally stolen it from somebody. <laughs> so he steals happily from the Benedictines, the Carthusians, the Dominicans, Franciscans, Carmelites, and many more, including, as I say there, the Theotines in trying to work out his spirituality, he picks from all of these spiritual traditions. He's tremendously respectful of them. He had tremendous help from the Benedictines and from the Carthusians in Paris. And he sees their tradition, he learns from them, he reads their constitutions and their spiritual writings, he takes notes of them and carries them. And as the years go by, he starts to forge them into something which kind of keeps, is the Ignatian spirit. I put the Theotines at the bottom. They still exist, actually. They're a small congregation. They were founded by a man called Cardinal Carafa. And he was a really kind of hard-nosed individual. And Ignatius, um, this was before he was ordained and he was still kind of in this exploratory form, he actually wrote a letter to Cardinal Carafa about the Theotines that he'd founded. And Ignatius, it's still there, it's often one of the first letters that you'll find in collections of Ignatius' writings. He writes, your dear eminence, um, uh, I've, I've seen the Theotines, they look very nice, but I think some things could be corrected. <laughs> um, Cardinal Carafa eventually became Pope. <laughs> and uh, Ignatius, where well, he was general of the Jesuits at that point, Ignatius said that every bone in my body shook. <laughs> But let me just point you a little bit more into the Ignatian prayer patterns. If you were to do a retreat, Ignatius would start to take you through all sorts of different things. And so nothing, no part of you is not prayerful. So Ignatius says your reason, your logic, your, all of those things, that your head, God has given you a head, use it and use it in your prayer. So therefore, if you were doing an hour's prayer in the spiritual exercises, this is kind of a gen very general pattern. General pattern. <clears throat> uh, introduction, he'll give you a few points. Slowing yourself down, you enter into the prayer. Slow down, slow down, take some deep breaths and all that type of thing. And then he'll give you a few points to think about. And then he'll give you a meditation. Now Ignatius uses these, these terms very clearly. A meditation is when, like when you take a psalm and you pray it through. And you take it through and you just read it through. Very Benedictine way of doing it. And then you come across a word. And you stay on the word, and your, your mind starts to unpack that word. Ignatius said, right, is basically setting your mind loose on something. When you've done that, when you've meditated on that passage of scripture, 
the next thing, and this is again the key Ignatian thing, this is where he is becoming far more unique in the prayer. And this is where he goes back to this Old Testament tradition. Is that no, the word there, colloquy. Ignatius at the end of each prayer, or the last stage of each prayer, colloquy. He says, go to Christ and talk to him about what you have prayed about. So sometimes it's, um, he's got a, a number of complex colloquies, but sometimes just go to Christ on the cross, imagine you there at the cross, and talk to Jesus on the cross. Colloquy. What he's doing, all of the head stuff goes back to the heart, and the heart interacts, the person to person, heart speaks to heart, Newman's phrase. Different type of prayer in the exercises, he'd say use the imagination. God's given you a wonderful imagination. Don't stamp all over it because it gives you all sorts of strange pictures at times. It's a great thing is the imagination. That's what his Ignatius would say, use the imagination in your prayer. Now he pinches from the Franciscans at this point because he would say, imagine the nativity, Christmas scene. Go into the Christmas scene. Feel the straw. Smell the donkey. All of those things. Use your imagination. God's given it to you. It's there. It's there to be used. It may be rusty. Use it. It's God's gift to you. So, in a prayer, in an hour's prayer in the exercises, he may say, do exactly the same thing. A few introductory points, uh, and then the contemplation. That's the contemplation. Imagine the scripture passage. Imagine Mary holding the baby Jesus. Imagine Jesus crying. Imagine the noises around the town. of Beth Enter into that. And then once you've done that, Back to the colloquy. Talk to Christ about that. The daily examine, the word examine is used. It's a prayer that Ignatius would expect every Jesuit to use. And even when Francis Xavier was far side of the world, uh, over on, on the Indian coast, and was writing letters that would take two years to get back, and two years to get over there, Ignatius would write to it, and Francis would say, there's very little time to do anything, I'm baptizing all the time. Ignatius would write and say, if you can't go to Mass, if you can't do this, if you can't do that, do the examine. The examine is the prayer of discernment of spirits for a day. Normally he'd expect that Jesuits should do it twice a day. Quarter an hour in the morning, quarter an hour in the middle of the morning, quarter an hour in the, in the evening. And what he's doing is he's saying, going back into that. Going back into the heart, Watch the movement. See what happened in the day. See where your heart was. Was your heart buoyed up? Was your heart down? Follow those spirits and you'll find God. <coughs> nice little picture. Just says there, the daily examine, creating space to experience God's love. A couple of final points. Where do we now in our modern world with this, these insights in terms of prayer and the digital age in which we are trying to pray? Maybe what would be the thing that Ignatius would ask us to do if we're trying to follow a tradition that he would give us to enter into that, very much that personal prayer, entering into the heart of it. Just, just to give you an example, the Jesuits, the, 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 Jesuit, the name Jesuit is, is an unusual one. It was actually originally used in Scandinavia as, um, as an attack on the Jesuits. And you don't find it actually in, in Jesuit literature, kind of in any literature until the 1960s. It was always kind of, it was a nickname that we never used. Um, it's al it was always sometimes known in English as the Society of Jesus, SJ. Um, but Ignatius, in some ways, that's the Latin form. The original that Ignatius has, which is from the, from the Spanish, is Compañía de Jesús the companions of Jesus. It's not the society of Jesus. You keep, it, it makes it look things like a kind of bank or something like that. The, Ignatius expects the Jesuits to be companions of Jesus. As they have prayed, as they have gone through the spiritual exercises, as they walk Je along with Jesus on those four or five hours of prayer a day, going through Galilee, going to Jerusalem, you learn a companionship with Christ. You learn a companionship with God. It's that companionship which is the core of our life's journey. It's that companionship that leads people then to strive and move. We don't, 
Our heads are just not there to be convinced. We can be convinced. If our hearts are not there, we don't go anything. Ignatius sees that the key to all of this is the heart. But let me just, a final, um, a final one, which are two, two images really, which is in the digital age, how should we experience and how should we, the two pictures that came to my mind which I thought were quite good. We live in a digital age and it's like trying to drink from a fire hydrant. So there's water pouring out, but there's huge amounts of water pouring out. Now, you can try and take a drink by putting your head down in front of it, but all you'll do is probably knock yourself unconscious. So it's possible to drink from the fire hydrant, but you've got to change your techniques of getting that water. In the digital age, we're being pounded by experience. We can find God, but we've got to be careful in how we're doing it. You can't just jump into it and expect to be able to get a drink. It's more likely to kill you. Maybe that's the more sedate version of it, the kind of moose drinking. Now, in one way, that looks far more placid, far more straightforward. Maybe that's the, the way of drinking from water from the centuries before the digital age. But Ignatius would actually say, no, it's not less dangerous as that. It's just different danger. That danger, you could quite easily have an alligator just kind of creeping up on the far side. Or the water could be contaminated, or whatever it would be. Different types of water. Ignatius would say to us, we're living in the digital age, so we tend to be living in the fire hydrant. So therefore, take care and drink from it. In Ignatius's time, they drank from the water that way. The sermon to spirits thing, maybe they weren't being rushed so much for water, but they had to be careful. You still had to discern the spirits when you were drinking. <coughs> People, I'm on too late. Let's pause. Nice little picture of a candle to finish with. Thank you. Have a break. <laughs> <laughs>